Oh, now it's on. Okay, I'm very happy to be here and see so many of you. Uh, let me just set up the presentation. And the clicker. Okay. Yep. There it is. Okay, so my name is Paulina Alanen. Uh, I'm the communications and marketing lead at Silo AI. Uh, first, since I do marketing, I gotta know this. Uh, how many of you have heard of Silo AI? Raise your hand. Okay, quite many. Very happy to see that. Um, so yeah, I'm not gonna tell you uh, too much about uh, just exactly um, what we're all about, but I, I would like to actually go deeper into what you just uh, just heard from the previous presentation and dive into three use cases that we have done together with our clients. Uh, but first a little bit about Silo. So uh, this is my team. Uh, this is taken in December uh, in our Christmas party and you can see there a sneak peek into our new logo as well. So basically what we are, uh, we're a 60 people uh, consulting company. So we have um, about um, we are 60 AI experts, out of which about 30 are PhD level experts. So our bread and butter is really the, uh, let's say, hardcore machine learning and tackling really the most complex problems that our clients may have, the business critical big problems that they have. So we work in uh, industries like um, smart cities, so that would include everything from automotive to maritime, um, infrastructure, um, then smart devices, so with sensors, IoT, these you would see at the at, um, production lines, heavy industry, manufacturing, uh, industries like that, uh, and then uh, also in other internet and uh, gaming companies are also our our clients um, and yep so this is basically these four here represent the AI expertise uh, split into four uh, so basically uh, computer vision natural language processing machine learning and then solution design or uh, software development that we do also in addition to the uh, more let's say machine learning skills um, we have five offices, uh, the biggest one here in Helsinki and then in Turku where we have uh, also many of our AI experts uh, and then in Oulu where we currently have a lot of software development but hopefully growing the AI team there as well and then two international offices in London and, and Palo Alto. But yeah, let's dive deeper into what we actually do or what our expertise is about. So computer vision as you might know, um, treats a lot of problems like detecting objects or uh, classifying images in the image data. So, for instance, we would, uh, if we would build uh, something for a client with this, would be like automating image or video analysis for them. I will have a concrete example very soon. And then natural language processing, so typically something like word or document classification or text tagging. This is something that's very much in use in customer service, for instance, because they get a lot of uh, similar inquiries. Let's say you work in a bank and then you get loan related requests, so it would be automatically tagged. Uh, that would be one example. So extracting information from documents and speeches like this one uh, and news and articles all over the internet, for instance. And then general machine learning, as we already learned from the previous, uh, predicting, understanding situations in complex environments, uh, like in an air, airport, uh, managing the air traffic, for instance. And like we also learned from the previous one, uh, mostly supervised learning, uh, like the case that I'm going to show you very soon, uh, unsupervised learning or reinforcement learning would be the techniques here. 
Uh, and then the solution design, so we also do the software and UI development to some extent. Sometimes we do that with partners because, like I said, we mostly stand for the machine learning part. But we do that as well. Okay, and now to the interesting bit. I'm very happy today that I have three cases and I can tell you the client of, of each of these. So we actually can tell you the exact case. So uh, this is a case that you may have heard about already because this has been public since last uh, July. Um, this is a flight prediction tool that we built together with Finnair. So the uh, aim was to improve the, the situational awareness of their uh, flights at the operations control center. And I'm happy that you brought up the example about uh, flight uh, predictions whether it's going to be delayed or not, uh, because this is exactly what this was about. So the problem was that at their operations control center, they uh, only had, uh, um, like in the dashboard, they had different flights and then the weather uh, reports, but they didn't really use any intelligent tool to sort of map out which flights were likely to be delayed. So they didn't have a machine learning based prediction in place. Now this is something that's very typical for machine learning to try to do this. Um, so then what we did uh, was that we, we built this uh, intelligent uh, feed that would then show in their dashboard so that the people working at the operations control center could use this information. And it predicted major delays accurately 20, 12 hours in advance. I'm going to dive a bit deeper into this. Uh, so basically the data that was used was the weather forecast. So this was flights delayed only because of the weather. There are a bunch of other reasons, but we focused on this. And then uh, also uh, the data that was taken in was the uh, known scheduled flights that were going to happen. Then historical delays, flights that had been delayed because of weather. Uh, and then also we consider some additional data sources like open data from the FMI. Um, and then what comes to the modeling, uh, basic classification, is the flight, the flight going to be delayed or not? Or, and regression, by how much is it going to be delayed? And at an hourly level, so they would get a new prediction every hour. And then we also built a separate model uh, that would feed into this actual prediction model. And this was the runway uh, capacity at helsinki Um So yeah, just to recap. Uh, weather forecast, pre-processing, runway capacity prediction, and then that would produce the flight delay prediction that would then alert the people that work at the operations control center. All right. Uh, then let's move on to a computer vision uh, case. So this is a Swedish client, uh, Tekniska Verken. Uh, they're an infrastructure company and their job is to make sure that some uh, very important sewage pipes <coughs> under some Swedish cities are uh, clean and don't have any blockages, for instance, which might happen. And I like this example because this really shows uh, the value of computer vision to me because I don't think anyone here would like any people watching this eternal feeds of uh, sewage pipe video material as their like, you know, main daily job. So this is something that's really labor intensive to, um, to like watch these feeds of video from these uh, tunnels and, and sewage pipes. And, and they do have a robot in place to shoot the video, but to analyze it, they didn't use any computer vision uh, before we started to build that. Um, and here's how we did it. So this is actually an example, like a mock-up. I can't really show you the actual UI here, but I'm going to explain it to you a bit better. So the data that we used, it's taken from these robots that go around the sewage pipes and take video of everything that they see there. Uh, now they used to create this uh, where, what and when reports about the defects that might happen, like blockages, leakages, or there can be some kind of um, other uh, anomaly at the pipe and then a human would have to go there and check like what has really happened. Then they need to also prioritize these defects. Some leakages are more important than others. So this is also something that they would then have to, dif um, have to identify from the video material that they would be getting. 
So we built an active learning based training workflow for the model. So what this means is that uh, we built a sort of this, this is from Mekelin and Katu, this is not from the tunnels in, in Sweden. Uh, but this type of UI where uh, the computer vision has already analyzed the material from the sewage pipes and has already labeled uh, and recognized the objects that are seen there. For instance, these defects or, or leakages. What then happens is that the human operator gets this report that has been entirely built by the robot and then the computer vision tool that has analyzed the material. But then there might be something of an anomaly, but then the human operator is like, no, but that's just a rat. That's not, that's not a huge defect that we would now have to go after. So then you, the human operator can go into this tool that has this UI uh, for annotating and then change that label that it's not critical. And then after that, the machine would learn it because it's based on active learning and then take that feedback. So this is what we call human in the loop. Uh, feedback so that these defects wouldn't be erased again after, after that. Um, so this is the, the annotation tool that, that we're building for, for Techniska Verken. And, and, the, and the aim is that the humans are taking this report and then either accepting or rejecting um, whatever the, the computer has recognized there as criti critical defects. All right, and then to the last bit, which is a bit different than maybe most of the machine learning cases that you have heard of. So we had the pleasure to work with Ule on this case called Chat Beyond the Grave. And I just wanted to take this case because I found it really fascinating. Uh, somebody working for uh, like in the, in the media and, and content space. Uh, so Ulla wanted us to boost their horror story and horror content with this um, ideally personalized generated content. And what we decided uh, was to uh, generate uh, with deep learning these images and stories that would be like horror stories or ghost stories. So our two experts, uh, they basically just used a month to do this. Uh, they decided to generate this text and images uh, and the aim for Ule then was to learn how much we can already now use NLP, natural language processing, and these uh, other guns, so uh, general adversarial networks that create new images to create this type of content. And I'm going to tell you about the two parts, so first the NLP part, natural language processing for the text generation, and then about the image generation. Um, so for the natural language processing, uh, the data that was used, uh, basically we wanted to have uh, a personality for the ghost, so it needed to have a name, age, and like a personal story to tell. So we took a data set of Finnish names and their frequencies in the 20th century, um, the cities and number of citizens of these cities for localization purposes. Um, and then we also needed to have something more personal, like what is the about story of the ghost person. So then we went uh, and got some uh, online dating services data so, so that we could see these kind of about stories, but also get hopes and regrets, because this is something ghosts usually have. They are coming back from the afterlife because they have some regrets. Uh, then we took an open source news data set from an online machine learning community called Kaggle uh, for cause of death generation. And then we used Wikipedia and uh, a book corpus of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, because that has uh, ghosts in it as well. And for the models, we used uh, GPT-2 and BERT. These are both very important and major NLP models that had huge advancements last year. Uh, basically, GPT is for, uh, was, and we used it also for, for just to create this uh, text based on the input that we gave it. And then BERT was more used uh, for the context so that the sentences between each other, they would make more sense just to put it on a, on a high level. 
And so we wanted the, the Finnish name, birth and death dates, about story, cause of death story and hopes and regrets. And this is what we got. <laughs> All my life I have tried to live a ghost story. I have tried my best to be a normal person, to live in a way that will bring me joy and comfort. But now, in my darkest days, I know I have lost all hope. Isn't that a good ghost story? You can read the other one from there. Uh, then we needed the image. And this is the final slide that I have. I, I can see that I'm running out of time. Uh, so here we also took another um, generative, mod uh, generative adversarial network, so GUN. Uh, this time StyleGAN, developed by NVIDIA. Bunch of Finns work there developing this model. Um, it's, it's trained on Flickr faces, uh, open source data set. Uh, and we actually took some real people's images that we had and, and tried to merge them with different types of images to create these ghost-like people. With this gun, the generative network, you can really create like actual normal looking people, but we really wanted to create something that wouldn't look like normal. And actually, which is funny, at the end we tried with different kinds of people, like old to young and, and only old people, but then we tried this chimpanzee. <laughs> and here is the result. That was the best one that we got. And, and this model is the same uh, that is also being used at uh, this person that does not exist. Dot com, which each time you load the page, it generates a new, new image there. So it, it was the same. But um, yeah, this is uh, now available through API to ULA. So perhaps in some time they will create a UI, and then when you land on their website, you will you will get your own personal ghost story. Let's see what comes up. Okay, but that was all for me. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much for having We are in our final sort of questions this time, but are you staying for the networking session? For the yeah, I, I can Awesome, great. Yeah. So you guys have a chance to talk to her then after, after the show. Uh, so next up we're going to have uh, Antti Rauha.